draw, not the one on the right. And so, of course, cotangents are last trig function that we're going to look at. And we'll start. So we're gonna we could plot points, but what I'm going to actually do is take our cotangent graph, the one on the left, and we're going to reciprocate it. And what that means, the x-intercepts, there's two x-intercepts, they're gonna turn into vertical asymptotes, and our vertical asymptote, which was <clears throat> from the uh, one over zero value that tangent had, when you reciprocate that, you're gonna get zero over one, which is zero. So you're gonna get a vertical asymptote turning into a x-intercept when you reciprocate it. What other points are gonna stay the same? Uh, the only points are one and negative one. They'll happen right about there and there. So those will be one and negative one. They happen at uh, pi over four and uh, three pi over four. So let's go ahead and redraw what we have. So this is cotangent. I'm gonna use blue for our vertical asymptote because it's gonna be on the, we had a zero at x equals zero. That's our vertical asymptote. It's going to be x equals zero. So it's gonna be right on top of the y-axis. So we've got x equals zero right there. And the other one is x equals pi. You're directly in between at pi over two. So we had a pi over two vertical asymptote. We have a pi over two x-intercept. And of course the other vertical asymptote, x equals pi. And we have positive one right here, negative one right here. Those are the two, the only two points that don't move when I reciprocate the graph. So this graph's gonna get reciprocated now. We have to connect these three together and also approach the left vertical asymptote. Uh, I cannot approach it on the bottom because I would need another uh, x-intercept to do so. So that can't happen, so we have to approach it on the top side. So there is one period of cotangent. Of course, there's more periods and more vertical asymptotes. If you kept drawing them, it would be a bunch of curves that just go on like this. And they also go uh, the other direction as well. So we're just doing one period. Now we'll do, uh, we'll just do one example of this, of, of a graph, and I'll put a, some shifts and Let's see, we'll do two shifts and a stretch. And we'll do the tangent graph. Well, might as well do cotangent because we just saw it right here. So this will be our example graph g of x equals three cotangent two x minus, let's do minus pi over two. So we need the period, it's probably the first thing to get. Now uh, before we get period, of course we have, uh, the period is definitely not two, the period is related to the two, but what you have to do is uh, write the, it's not two pi over a, but now it's just pi over a, because tangent and cotangent have a uh, single pi period. So now our a is two. So our period is pi over two. Now the shift is not pi over two. We have to first factor. We could do guess and check. 
And if we guess this and check it, obviously we get negative uh, two pi, not pi over two. So what I need to do is divide by four. Now when I multiply, two times negative pi over four is negative pi over two. So we shift right pi over four. And we have one more uh, transformation to worry about. We're gonna stretch by three. So vertical stretch by three. So we're gonna go right pi over four. And we have a pi over two period. If we measure in fourths for common denominator to make this easy for us, we're gonna go two more pi over fours. So there's one pi over four, two pi over four. Now we're not at two pi over four, one pi over four, two pi over four, we're at three pi over four. And the period begins and ends with vertical asymptotes. Our x intercept is right in the middle, and that will be two pi over four. Now, how do we deal with the vertical stretch by three? Well, if you noticed, I wasn't very careful right here about one and negative one. Those are the two points that I added in. All that's gonna happen is one is gonna get stretched vertically up to three, and negative one is gonna get stretched vertically down to negative three. So it will have the effect of uh, making this basically look taller or steeper. So we can try to be as accurate as we can here. So those are the quarter points. Uh, if I label them, this is two pi over eight, they would be three pi over eight. And some other pi over eight is five pi over eight. And they need to go up three, which is gonna actually be, if we try to do this to scale, I have a four is sort of close to one. It's a little less than one actually. So three would probably be up there and down there. And now you can see the steepness that's going to happen here. Draw this up a little taller. So that's how it would look like if we try to draw it to scale. Uh, that's really ugly and it looks a lot just like a uh, line. So what I'm gonna do instead, is take those threes out. Let's just draw a, definitely a thinner curve, but I like to have a little bit better of a bend to it. And now I'm just gonna say three, negative three like that. So definitely not the scale, because if you look, if you go up three, that's about the same as going over pi over four, obviously. This distance right here is less than one, and this distance is three, and Definitely not to scale. So that is our last uh, graph that we're gonna do for our regular trig functions. Uh, I won't graph this last one, but I'm just gonna remind you if you have a negative horizontal shift or a horizontal reflection, how to deal with it. Tangent and cotangent are both odd. So if you had a graph
So for this, there is a negative. If you treat it like this, it'll be a negative period. So we're gonna do, before we talk about the period or the horizontal compression, or it would actually be a reflection, we're gonna deal with it algebraically. So it's negative three x plus pi over three. So I unmultiplied negative pi by negative three, which is negative pi over negative three. So I get regular pi over three. That's how I get the plus pi over three. You just take what's there and you unmultiply it or divide it by the coefficient in front of x. Now, right here we have a negative three and we can, cotangent is odd, so I'm going to bring that negative through the function. And we have period. So it'll just be a pi over three, shift left. Also pi over three. Oh, this will actually be interesting because our period is uh, the same as the phase shift or the horizontal shift. The negative is going to be a vertical reflection right here. Actually, let's go ahead and graph this. This will be more interesting than I planned. So we're going left pi over three. Our period is also pi over three. That means it fits perfectly into uh, the left edge is pi over three of the period, negative pi over three, and the right is zero. We're graphing cotangent. So I get vertical asymptote at the end and the other end now that's supposed to be at the y-axis. So I'll show that by just, uh, ooh, I could do a better zero. So I'm showing it's at the y-axis by writing x equals zero right there. And of course the other one's x equals negative pi over three. Halfway in between, we have our y-intercept, x-intercept, sorry, it's early which is negative, so we're going halfway. It should be pretty obvious what this is, but if it wasn't zero and negative pi over three, if it was another number and negative pi over three, you average together zero and negative pi over three to get the midpoint. And of course that's negative pi over six. And just, you could copy down your cotangent graph like this, uh, but the last thing I need to do, so I did period, I did uh, the phase shift. What I need to do is vertical reflection. So that's what vertical reflection is going to look like. You're just turning it upside down. So I'll just erase this right here. Oh no. I don't know what I lost. All right, uh, we're gonna go there's a regular cotangent graph. Well, that's a regular cotangent. We're flipping it upside down. So up is down, down is, so this up is down, down is gonna be up, and y equals zero stays where it is. So we get this graph right here. So there is our cotangent graph. So if I give you a tangent, cotangent, secant, cosecant quiz, today's Tuesday, Thursday would be a good day for it. This is the last graph from that section. So Thursday would be a good day for uh, the rest of graphing. And of course I could ask you the forwards or backwards question, just like the last quiz. So I could give you, just like the problems we've been doing, a cotangent uh, function, and then ask what graph does it come from? Or I could ask you, I could give you a graph and ask you what uh, function the graph, that could make that graph. So there are some more algebraic properties that I wanna look at uh, before we move on to inverses. And we'll use, we'll base all these off the graph. So 
So these weren't in my notes, so I'm just gonna freestyle on these, and hopefully we'll get to uh, correct conclusions. And we'll start with, we did cosine sine first, so let's start with those guys. So I'm just gonna sketch out a really quick uh, cosine first. And I'm gonna put sine in blue directly on top. So sine starts at zero, zero in the middle, zero at the end, one right here, negative one there. So here is one period. I'm going to draw a little extra on the sine function. That needs to go up a little higher. So that's two pi. So this distance right here is one fourth of that, which is pi over two. Now from these graphs right here, so the black one is y equals cos, the blue one. And we'll go a little bit further right there. Actually, I want to draw, I do want to go a little further on the cosine graph but I want to go a little further this way. So this is five pi over two, right there, negative pi over two. All right, so I could shift cosine and get the sine function, or I could shift sine and get the cosine function. So if we think of cosine, let's start with cosine. So if I take cosine and shift it, pi over two to the right. So from the graphs, that should be pretty obvious. Take the black graph, shift it right pi over two, and it will be right on top of the blue graph. So how do we write that? Cos x, I wanna go right, is sine x. So I just rewrote that sentence in math. So there's cosine shifted right pi over two equals sine. Of course, I could shift, I could do the exact same thing to sine, but shift sine left. So let's write that sentence. So that should be pretty obvious on the graph. Shift the blue to the right, or to the left, pi over two and it'll be sitting right on top of the black cosine graph. So that is sine x plus pi over two equals cosine. So those are two properties right there. Now what I'm gonna do is use the uh, fact that cosine is even, so I can write so cosine pi over two minus or pi cosine of x minus pi over two. I can make the whole entire input negative. Put a negative sign in front. Nothing changes, and I get this cosine down here which of course is negative x plus pi over two. And I like to put the positive part first. And this equals sine x. 
So this identity is pretty useful. Might as well circle. Mm, that top identity is usually not uh, circled or put on a cheat sheet, so I'm not going to do that here. So I will put this identity I just put in a box on your cheat sheet. So there is another identity I want to look at. I'll use a red pen for that. What I'm going to do is take our sign function and flip it over. Like this. So you could uh, write it as negative sine x and then use algebra or the odd property and push the negative inside the sine function. So how does a red function relate to the black function? So it looks like if I take the red function and shift it left pi over two, I get the cosine function. So sine negative x shifted left, whoa, shifted right pi over two. So we're taking the red function and you can see it happen. Uh, there's pi over two and if we shift right pi over two, what was the x intercept? Uh, is going to become this new x-intercept here. So you want to shift the red function right pi over 2. That's not exactly what I wanted because when I use the odd property, we're going to get right above there. identity I want is sine pi over 2 minus x equals cos x, which hopefully is an identity. It's not in my notes. I know you need it on your web work. So how in the world are we going to get this? So another thing, if you want to prove, you can start with what you know or start with what you want to show is true and then work obviously on one side. So treat it like an identity. So I want this to be true, now I need to prove it. So I don't know that we have cosine yet. So I factored out a negative, so this is negative sine x minus pi over two. And I'm going to graph this. So our period is standard to pi. We're shifting right pi over 2. And then we're going to do a vertical uh, reflection. And I'm going to graph this function now. If I can write words, G R A P H. So period is 2 pi, we're starting at pi over 2, and that's 5 pi over 2, sine starts 0, 0 in the middle, 0 at the end. We are doing a vertical reflection, so we're going to go down, up, okay. So that should be negative sine x minus pi over two. Now in red, oh, we're going blue. 
in blue, I'm going to graph regular cosine. So cosine is pretty easy. Uh, here's 2 pi. We've graphed it a lot before. Cosine starts at 1, ends at 1, negative 1 in the middle. Oh, there we go. So unless I made a mistake on one of those two, they have the uh, same graph right there. So we get sine equals regular cos x. And that is what we wanted to show. Sine pi over 2 minus x equals cos x. So those two, uh, you need it on your uh, web works. So I will extend the date for those, and now you can officially complete them. So I'm not going to write memorize. These are on, they will be on your new cheat sheet. So this is 10.6 inverse functions. Now in this section, uh, we're gonna cover sine and cosine and tangent. Uh, secant, cosecant, and cotangent all have inverses, uh, but they get a little more annoying because the periods are, uh, they're disjointed uh, sine, cosine, and tangent, you're going to see uh, we can take pieces of them that are continuous, that don't have vertical asymptotes. So really fast review, inverse functions. So remember there is one, so before we talk about inverse functions, let's talk about functions. So there is one function rule. f of x is a function if each x in the domain of f I should put the word for if for each x in the domain of f f of x has exactly uh, let me take out the word exactly but has one value This is to say each input has exactly one output or whatever number you take and F it, you get a number back out. You don't get two numbers and you don't get something that's not a number or undefined or anything like that. Uh, now if you think about vertical asymptotes, well, that X for the vertical asymptote is not inside the domain of F. So you don't get the, uh, you don't have to worry about F of X being undefined because there is no x in the domain at those uh, vertical asymptotes. So this is the one function rule. Another way to think about functions, you can think about domain, range, and then f is what takes you from the domain to the range. So you get some number over here, we usually call it x. You're gonna send it over to here. Usually we'll call this y. And you could call it f of x or y. I think it'll be better to call it y right here. I'll write that y equals f of x outside. All right, inverse function. Oh, and in this uh, representation, this x does not go to two y values. That would not be a function. And likewise, this x goes to a y value. It doesn't go to nowhere. It doesn't go to uh, something that's not a number. The inverse function goes the exact opposite way. What it's going to do is to take an element over here, a number in the range of the original f, take it back to the an element in the domain of f. So 
so it goes the opposite direction, the inverse direction. So one way to think about it, it turns the arrow around, or it goes backwards. Now if I asked F inverse, hey, what are all these numbers over here? F inverse would not say, oh, those are the range of F. What F inverse would say is all those numbers are my domain. So as far as F inverse is concerned, that's the domain of F inverse. And F inverse, if you asked it, what are all the numbers over here? It would say, ah, oh, that's my range, the range of F inverse. So domain of F is the range of F inverse. And the range of F is the domain of F inverse. So they swap domain and ranges. F inverse will be much happier if you call things on the right side in its domain as X's and the range as Y's. Algebraically, how are F and F inverse related? So normally we have Y equals F of X. So I use triple equal signs to compare equations. So if y equals f of x, and you have an inverse, you have this f inverse function, what you can do, so y normally came from the range of f. What can you do with things in the range of f? You can f inverse them. And what do you get back out? You better get the x that it came from. So this is the algebraic relationship between f and f inverse. Uh, this is from pre-calculus one, so I'm gonna put a squiggle around it. So this is recall from pre-cal one. That is how functions and their inverses are related. Now in order to talk about an F inverse, we need a special property of F. So let's look back at this representation. So what happens if two x values go to the same y value? So both x and x naught, when you f them, they both go to y. Now when I turn this function around, we're gonna have some problems. What problem do we have? Well, you're gonna, f inverse is gonna take y and now send it to two places, right there. It has to go back to x and x naught. What that means is f inverse would not be a function because there's an element in the domain of f inverse that goes to two elements in the range of f inverse. So this is a problem. This property of having two x values going to the same y value um, is one to one. So what we need is our original function f needs to be one to one. So f has an inverse. Exactly when f is one to one. f has an inverse exactly when f is one to one. So how do you know a function is one to one? There are a few ways to do it. Uh, algebraically, there's a nice way to do it. But what we're gonna do is look at the uh, graph. So I'll just write down algebraically. If any x1 and x2 in the domain, anytime f of x1 equals f of two, x2, that means x1 has to equal x2. So this we don't really need to worry about. I'm not going to make you prove it algebraically, but this is algebraically. You say, well, if I have two x values that when I f them have the same y value, then those x values better be the same thing. A uh, graphical way is what we're gonna use. And 
It's the horizontal line test. So normally functions have to pass the vertical line test. The horizontal line test, if you pass the horizontal line test, your function is one to one. So we're always abbreviating in math, so we'll go HLT. Uh, so passing means f of x is 1 to 1. So we start with the cosine first. So I'll start with cosine here. All right, obviously fail. Definitely not 1 to 1. Uh, plenty of... Pretty much any horizontal line between 1 and negative 1 will fail. Uh, look at the x-axis right there. That's the horizontal line that's already on the graph, so we're going to fail. The way we fix this is we're going to restrict the domain. And I'm going to graph some more of the function like that. So we're going to fail horizontal line test. So we're going to restrict. the domain so we pass horizontal line test and we will do this tomorrow and we're going to cut out a whole lot of x values we're actually only, only going to leave a very small interval of x values uh, and we are going to start at zero so we're going to start at zero and then decide how far can we go to the right before we start failing again so we're going to cut out all that. So get rid of all that stuff. And if we start at zero and go to the right, how far can we go? And I don't want to leave you too much in suspense. It should be pretty obvious. If we pass that, we're going to fail the horizontal line test. So we're going to go zero to pi and scrap all that stuff right there. 